This guy here is St. Cuthbert. He was a monk who lived in the 7th century, and he came out of the Celtic tradition of monasticism, um, which uh, came out of Ireland and sent missions and monasteries all over Europe uh, and had a great deal to do with uh, the maintaining classical learning and, and Christianity. Now, when a revived Roman church um, sort of spread across Europe too, uh, there was differences um, in in religious practice and some minor differences in doctrine too. Um, uh, and so the, the old English uh, culture, its Christianity, was intersected by these two somewhat competing forms of Christianity. And, and Cuthbert was an adherent of the, the Northern um, and the, the, uh, the, the Irish, the Celtic uh, practices of Christianity. Um, and he was, uh, he and there's miracles that he supposedly performed and there's saints lives about him and he became the patron saint and hero of the north of England. Uh, this is a picture of him that was painted on a church built by Normans, by the people who invaded in 1066 and took over. Um, and it, it may very well have been painted by a Anglo-Saxon artisan or craftsman, uh, we don't know. But I include this picture just to give you a sense of the fact that any fantasy that people have of Old English being this purely homogeneous culture, this, this single culture that, that wasn't uncontacted, that's the pure, real, Un unadulterated thing that sometimes uh, gets suggested by the expression Anglo-Saxon is a myth. Um, England was always a culture in contact with other cultures, giving and taking and exchanging and fighting um, over what its own traditions and customs mean. I say all this to introduce um, vocabulary. This is maybe probably going to be more interesting than the previous two videos, videos in the series where we talked about pronunciation and grammar. When we think about how we access the, the meaning and life of another culture, we, we often think about words and the kind of words that they used, not verb forms so much. Um, so we're going to look at, at the, some of the, the way that uh, the distinctive features of, of Old English vocabulary and the vocabulary that resulted from language contact, particularly with Latin and Old Norse and Britonic, which was the form of Celtic, uh, the, the ancestor of, of to modern Welsh that was spoken in uh, early medieval Britain. Um, so to, the first thing we want to talk about is compounds and kennings, and you have an, um, an exercise in this unit um, where you're working on this. Now, compounds are where an, uh, you take two different words and you put them together to form a new word. So we have the, this root sa, 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 and then man, which means what you think it means, person or man, deor, wild animal, that, and it had a broader meaning than it does now, rima, shore, faru, journey. So these become saman, or sailor, sedeor, or sea creature, sarima, or seashore, and safaru, or voyage. Now, all these are clear enough in meaning, right? You can kind of put together what they mean from the, the, the individual components. Now, that's a, that's a common thing with compounds. What about this here? We have sa plus mer, and this is the root of the word mer, which are, used to just mean horse, but now it means, you know, just specifically female horse. What is a sa mer? You might guess a seahorse, right? Wrong. It's a ship, right? And so this is illustrative of how a kenning works. A kenning is like a riddle. It, it works sort of metaphorically. It combines aspects of two different words, but not in any way that you might um, uh, predict from the individual roots. So nichtelm comes from a word nicht for night and helm for helmet. But if you put those together, it means darkness, which is, I guess sort of makes sense. It, it covers your eyes. Um, what else? Banhus, bone plus house. What do you think that means? I think it could mean various things. Um, you know, we saw in Swedish already, Barhus is a uh, mortuary, so that's a possibility, a cemetery, a grave. In fact, it means body. It's, 
the house of your bones is your body. Your, your, yeah, so there you go. Um, swan rod. Swan rod. Hmm, what could that mean? A river, a stream, a lake, a, 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 I don't know, it, but it means ocean. So, um, again, in, uh, there's a lot more use of kennings in poetry, um, but that, that is one of the basic features of this language. Now, if you've done the Reading McWhorter um, Magnificent Bastard Language Chapter 1, I want to talk to you about a few terms before we get into the next section where we talk about loan words into Old English. John McWhorter's basic thesis in this chapter of, of Our Magnificent Bastard Language um, is that Old English is um, affected by the grammar of uh, Celt of, of the Celtic language Britonic that was spoken in Britain when the Angles and Saxons and Jutes moved in, um, and the language that is the ancestor of modern Welsh. He uh, says that this is not co commonly overlooked because co most commonly Old English philologists and, and English uh, lingu linguists don't know Celtic languages. They're pretty difficult. Um, and but, so even if th there wasn't a lot of loan words from Britonic, it still had a pretty profound influence. And some of the words that he uses to um, talk about the way that languages affect each other are the following. First, we have patois. Um, and this isn't a formal linguistic term. It is the word, for example, that Jamaicans use to refer to their um, sort of uh, deep Jamaican dialect of English. It's almost, it is a language of its own, really, um, but it's not standard. And it's a speech or language that is considered non-standard, although the term is not formally defined in, linguist, in linguistics. And therefore, patois can refer to pigeons, creoles, dialects, or vernaculars, but not commonly to jargon or slang. And a pigeon, we're going to get into this later, so I'm just briefly introducing this now. A pigeon is when... Uh, you have people who speak different languages and have no common language attempting to cobble together a way of communicating with each other. And so they form a pidgin where they exchange words and create a, a simple language. It usually has a very basic grammar um, that, that's used. And pidgins arise in situations of, of contact between different peoples and trade languages. Um, what happens sometimes, though, is that when you get a community that forms and reproduces and a society that develops out of a pidgin-speaking community, the, all the grammar that was lost in the process of making a pidgin um, gets reintroduced, although sometimes with new features, but basically there's a certain level of grammatical complexity that any human language has. And so that complexity returns, and so you get a creole, which is, comes from a French word meaning mixture, but it is a full-fledged language, not a simplified uh, set of, of words and grammar, such as a pidgin. Now, a dialect is basically just a kind of language. It's just um, the difference between a language and a dialect, well... Basically, a language is, more, is what we call a respectable or standard dialect. I had a linguistics professor who once said that a language is a dialect with an army. So we, we call dialects, uh, when we call something a dialect when it's non-standard, when it, when it doesn't have the same kind of prestige or official capacity as a standard language. And this is also tr true, um, especially of what we call a vernacular. And that a, a vernacular is what people speak when they're not thinking about what they speak, when they're not trying to be correct, correct when they're not trying to adopt a standard. And so just, just a, a brief overview of some of these words that we use to describe various kinds of non-standard languages. And McWhorter's thesis is basically that English is a creole. It has um, a vocabulary largely derived from Germanic, but a vocab but a grammar that is a mixture of Germanic features and Celtic features. And this is a debatable thesis, but it, it's an interesting one, which is why I'm having you read it. Um, so let's talk about some uh, words that did over uh, languages that did overtly influence the lexicon, the vocabulary of Old English. The first one, obviously, is Latin. And now some Latin words come into English before. Um, well, they 
they they they go. Some Latin loan words were brought to England by the Angles and Saxons. Words such as uh, street, words such as monat or or the word for mi for money. Um, these are words that early Germanic tribes had ad adopted from the Romans before in back in the High Roman Imperial period. Um, but a great deal more Latin words come into English during the Old English period, um, such as abbas, which comes into Old English as abod, and in modern English as abbot. Apostolus, apostle, apostle, candela, candle, candle, churiacum, churice, church, diabolus, devil, devil, discipulus, discipul, disciple, episcopus, bishop, bishop, are you starting to see a pattern here in terms of the range of experience and meaning that these words revolve around? These aren't words about hunting. They're not words about government. They're not words about war. They're pretty much all words about religion and the church. The Latin was the language of religion. It was the language of the church. And thus, uh, and the Old English people did not really develop their own um extensive vocabulary for religion and for religious institutions uh, that when they were readily available already from Latin, they pretty much borrowed them. So most of the, the um, hundreds of loan words into Latin, uh, into Old English, are from the church. Now we have a few others, such as um, in place names that go back to Rome, uh, Anglo-Roman times. So for example, the, uh, the word Chester, as in Westchester or Winchester or Gloucestershire and so on, that root Chester goes from a, goes comes from a Roman root castrum, which meant camp. In fact, and, and so Roman encampments in in Romano Britain times became the basis of later English towns, and we can tell which ones were Roman encampments frequently because they have that Chester in their name. Um, now. <clears throat> Another main source of, of loan words into Old English was a result of a whole bunch of Danes, which was a similar but not identical um, a linguistic group. They spoke Old Norse, uh, uh, conquering a lot of Britain. Um, here's a re we're revisiting that, uh, that, that Dane law area, this area that was governed by Danes. And there was a mixture of English speaking and Danish people in this part of of Britain. And so the Norse brought a lot of loan words. There are perhaps a thousand words in present day English that derive from Norse. Uh, um, the most common of these are, as we discussed in the last video, are they, them, and there. Although it did take three to six hundred years for this to fully take over the forms hie, hiera, heora, that, that were in uh, Old English. Um, a lot of other words, though, Anger, from anger meaning sorrow. Bag, cake, crook, fellow, from the Norse compound felagi, someone who puts down money, a companion, a partner. Flat, law, window, this, I like this one. Vender aus, from the wind's eye. This, this comes from the Old Norse loan word. Get, scrape, take, sister, skin, low, odd, ugly, and many, many other words come from Old Norse. We can thank the Vikings. Another interesting uh, thing, you actually, the word Viking itself, um, we find the same root, of the, the word Viking, you should know this, is, the word Viking is um, actually, it's not a, an ethnic group or a nation, it's a job. To go Viking was to, to take your boat and sail into harbors and upstreams, and the root Vik meant um, Vik, the V-I-K meant a harbor or a stream or an inlet or something like that, because that's where you would uh, raid in your ships and burn and pillage and do all your your, vi your, your Viking when you would go Viking, right? And that same root, um, V-I-K, uh, goes back to an old Germanic root that was brought into Britain by the old English people, by the Angles and the Saxons, and that is um, became the root in the place names witch, as in um, Dunwich, Norwich, 
uh, I'm trying to think of other sandwich, <laughs> as in the Sandwich Islands. So which um, meant harbor. So it's just an interesting thing that we get the sound change um, in English where the v becomes a w and the k becomes a ch, but that doesn't happen in the North Germanic languages such as Old Norse. So uh, that vich is cognate with the, the root word of Viking. Moving right along, we're going to talk about uh, final, the last thing. We're just going to talk about those few words from Britonic, Celtic that do come into Old English. Okay, Celtic, Britonic loanwords in Old English, there's not that many of them, and there's some debate as to, for, on some of these as to whether they are from Celtic or, or Britonic or not. Um, but uh, again, I think McWhorter argues that uh, he's one of those people who is more likely to say, hey, look, there they were, they were living right next to each other. Do you have a better theory? Um, these include basket, beak, Brat. This is an interesting one. It's from um, a cloak or cloth, a ragged garment, a beggar's child. And so, so this, the, that's how the, the semantic shift works. Um, brock is a word that I, you, means badger. Um, and I guess it's used in Lowland Scots and Northern English. Um, a lot of place names uh, have um, Celtic origins in the same tragic way that a lot of place names in North America have. Uh, indigenous languages, right? You know, it's like, what's this place called? Oh, this place is called Coom or something. This is the valley. Oh, it's a very nice place. We'll take it, you know? Um, dad and daddy is not a form that we find in other Germanic languages. That, that comes from Celtic. Um, doe, a deer, uh, a female deer. Flannel, gob, as in mouth, lump, mouthful. Nook, all of these are Celtic words, there's some others besides, but basically very few, mostly place names, um, and far more from Norse and from Latin, but the vast majority of Old English vocabulary is Germanic, and that vocabulary, that Old English vocabulary, forms the kernel of our language today, even though we have so many, many loanwords from French and from Latin and from Greek and other languages, the, the 100 most commonly used words in everyday life, words that describe basic day-to-day -day experience, you know, father, mother, sister, sun, moon, ground, um, words for animals, words for, um, you know, body parts, all of these come from that Germanic vocabulary that Old English brought uh, with it when the Anglo-Saxons and Jutes came to uh, the island of Britain and started farming and settling and building their kingdoms and eventually um, uh, giving way to Middle English and Early Modern English. Uh, so this is the last part of our series on the Old English language. Thanks for listening.